Hello and a warm welcome to Econoday Unplugged. It's Tuesday, 5th of July, 2022. It's time for our monthly global roundup again. So on the podcast today, we have Terry Sheehan on US East Coast, Max Sato in British Columbia, and Brian Jackson in Sydney. I'm Jeremy Hawkins in London, and apologies if I sound a bit more croaky than usual this week, as hopefully now I'm on the path to uh, recovery from the dreaded COVID. So the combination of major economic, political and health surprises have meant that what would normally be seen as unusually high levels of market volatility have almost become the norm in 2022. However, recent extreme swings in asset prices also hint that investors are now seeing the global economy as a turning point. Inflation is still too high, pretty well everywhere, and in some countries still rising. But commodity, in the commodity markets, wheat futures are back around pre-Ukraine crisis levels. Copper is down around an 18-month low. So the bottom line appears to be that the recession talk now is getting louder. And if recession is just around the corner, aggressive central bank tightening might no longer be the preferred or even appropriate central bank policy option. So here's as we move around our team of experts is what the Connor Day's take is on where recession risks are the most real. So as usual, let's kick off with Terry. Right, Terry. U.S. stocks have recorded their worst first half in more than 50 years. The yield curve is just about inverted again. And according to one of New York's Fed's economic models, the probability of a hard landing is now 80 percent. Moreover, Econoday's economic consensus divergence index for the U.S. has been in largely negative surprise territory since early March and currently stands at one of its lowest readings in 2022, clearly indicating that markets have been too optimistic in their expectations for the U.S. economy. So the big question then, recession or no recession, what's your call and what should we be looking out for to guide us one way or the other? Well, we had an interesting little divergence in data on Friday in that the St. Louis Fed's uh, GDP nowcast for the second quarter said growth around 3.89%, which sounded very good. But then we had the Atlanta Fed GDP now forecast, and it said growth negative 2.10. So um, that was a bit of a a surprise. Pause. Sorry, can I interject? It. Um, does it really suggest then, that these now casts are total waste of time? The fact that you've got two, you know, respected Fed bodies coming out with completely different numbers, or is it a little bit more to it than that? Well, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, I personally will not put over much confidence in either of these until we've seen the employment data on Friday. Mm-hmm. That's really the decisive number uh, in advance of the advance estimate of GDP, which is um, July 28th, I believe. Uh, But what it does tell us is that some of the things in the U.S. economy, which are more measured by the St. Louis measure, are doing pretty well. On the other hand, we have the things that the Atlanta Fed keeps track of, and they are not doing as well. Uh, My guess would be that we're going to see somewhere in between the two. Now, over time, um, the Atlanta Fed has a slightly better correlation with the actual release number in the advance estimate of GDP. Mm -hmm. So I give that a little more credence, uh, but they don't tend to match up that well with the actual number. So all that aside, We are looking at potentially two quarters in a row of negative growth in the U.S. As a rule of thumb, that's a recession. Uh, But, of course, the NBER, who calls recessions, it's more complicated than that. We have to balance against that the fact that our labor market, at least so far, is doing extremely well. So uh, it's one of those things that I have to echo Fed Chair Powell in that There's a path to a soft or softish landing, but it's going to be a real challenge to get there. And yes, I think the recession risks are quite elevated right now. All right. If I were to ask you whether you think there will be or there won't be a U.S. recession, let's say, by the end of next year, where, where, where would your bet be? I think we're going to see a short, shallow recession. Uh, But what I really want to see is my favorite Uh, recession indicator, which is the Fed's beige book, because although it's not hard data, 
it presents a pretty good picture of what's going on in the current U.S. economy. Uh, the one out about eight weeks ago wasn't signaling recession. It was signaling slower growth. Uh, but we've got one in about a week um, next Wednesday, and that I think will tell us pretty decisively whether we are moving toward recession or not. Okay, now I'll guess particularly from, from your side, given the way the, the US economy is put together, I mean, there has to be a big focus on the consumer sector. And just quickly yes. from my side, looking at the numbers, I mean, real consumer spending hasn't grown so far this quarter, if we take April and May together. Uh, consumer yes. conference is clearly falling very sharply. Yes. Uh, should investors be concerned about this or do you think it's going to be kind of like a, a temporary blip and we should, you know, if we should see it pulling back later on in the year? Well, we got out the, our um, motor vehicle sales numbers this morning, and they were up, but barely from the prior month. And from everything I can see, if it's not something related to energy or food costs, uh, I, I think um, the dollar value of retail sales is not strengthening right now. Now, that could turn around for July because there are a number of things that tend to boost sales in July. But I think by the end of the second quarter, we are going to be seeing very soft uh, personal consumption expenditures relative to what we've seen in the last couple of years. OK, um, you mentioned obviously we do have the uh, employment report coming out on Friday. Um, is there anything in particular we should be looking you know, within that? And I guess you know, with a view to what the FOMC is going to do, it seems that you know, markets are being coming from the standpoint now whereby you know, this Fed tightening is almost given you know, during the rest of this year. And they paired, paired back some of their speculation about um, how far they might move in 2023 in light of recent numbers. But is there something, well, for example, I, I just, just pull back a bit, I say, what now do you think is the, the market consensus for the July FOMC? And what would have to happen in the employment report on Friday, do you think, to, to, to really shift that speculation? Um, I think it would just have to be um, an unusually weak report compared to what we've been seeing. Uh, we've s still got you know, a tremendous number of job openings, but I think what we may be seeing in the payroll data soon is that businesses are just not going to hire for the open jobs. You know, part of it's a labor shortage. Mm -hmm. Part of it is they're concerned about hiring people they may not need later. So um, I think payroll growth is going to slow down considerably. Um, and a lot more than we've been seeing would be a shock. Um, the other thing would be any significant increase in the unemployment rate. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see that. Um, historically, June is actually a pretty stable report. It's usually not subject to special factors like weather. Um, it tends to pick up a few extra hires from the May graduates. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this the the June report probably won't be anything uh, too out of the ordinary. It could it could be the July report that's really going to be more pivotal. Okay, fair enough. And you mentioned unemployment in there, and given this one, you know, the, the Fed's dual mandate, um, it, do you think there's a kind of threshold for a pain as far as the Fed's concerned if we were to start to see the unemployment rate rising, whereby all of a sudden the idea of aggressive tightening uh, now looks rather less likely? Uh, I think it would have to go up almost half a percent before the Fed would start to feel uncomfortable with it. The current rate is so low in historical terms that it would be hard to say that the labor market had experienced any sort of loosening that was unusual. Um, but, you know, uh, these are strange times in many ways. And um, things like um, the slowdown in the housing market, which is pretty clear as a response to higher rates, uh, could mean that we see slowing of hiring in critical industries like construction uh, and, uh, consu again, consumer spending because people won't be buying houses and the things that go in the houses they buy. 
So um, there is definitely uh, some drag for the economy there. Okay, fair enough. Well, that's it from me. Um, Any else you want to put in before we shift across? No, let's hear from the others. Right, okay. Let's go across the border then. Uh, Mr. Sato, now, you live in... (coughs) <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, you live in one of the countries uh, le- that we cover, which seems to be outperforming compared to, well, most of the others anyway. Um, you've had um, the bank, um, um, Conaday's um, Economic Consensus Divergence Index well above zero uh, for most of this year, really, suggesting that you know, the economy really has been outperforming. You also had a notice, uh, a survey from the Bank of Canada already on Monday, um, suggesting that business and consumer inflation expectations the next couple of years are at record highs. So is it kind of guaranteed that we're going to see another aggressive move by the Bank of Canada where are what next week, isn't it? Or is there still something potentially that might cause them to be a little bit more cautious? Um, judging from the, um, the official comments in the past and how they uh, behaved, I think uh, Bank of Canada's leadership uh, made it clear that um, they they have to raise rates more, um, more often probably by a wider margin than maybe expected last year. So I would say 75 basis point hike uh, is a done deal. Is there any talk at all of recession in your part of the world? Well, the, obviously the question's being asked, but uh, uh, both the uh, uh, officials and the economists, uh, they're saying chance is really low at this point. So again, I suppose if I just go back to the, from the question I was asking to Terry, looking at the consumer side, um, you have this uh, this Bloomberg uh, Nanos con- Weekly Consumer Confidence Index, which has, if I remember rightly, has declined for about nine straight weeks now. And its lowest level outside of the last two um, economic crises. Is that something which might actually cause the Bank of Canada to to perhaps just to to slow down the rate of of increase and its tightening? Or is it something which perhaps they want to see because the economy needs to cool down anyway? I think both the Fed and the BOC, they're trying to catch up. I think they made Mm -hmm. a mistake. They made a wrong call saying this is transitory. They, they they said that w- way too long uh, uh, before admitting that um, they were a little bit behind the curve. So I think uh, the, what we are seeing now is something they should have done months earlier. So uh, I think this is an initial stage for uh, both on, on the south and north of the border. Uh, I don't think uh, they would hesitate uh, for the upcoming, maybe upcoming in the next meeting, um, um, the, the something that ha- they have to done right now. So um, also the the Bank of Canada in the report too, they have pointed out that uh, we are coming from a very high, quick recovery from the pandemic, high level of uh, growth and mm-hmm. Um, activity so coming down a bit um, is more like what what they desire okay fair enough and also i've got to ask you i suppose particularly since it's canada about the housing market because the i mean the bank of canada has made noises about this ongoing strength of the housing market for such a long time now and it being a you know a potential threat to growth should we get some real problems in, in that part of um a big part of the economy um so if if we really look at aggressive bank of canada tightening uh, well presumably through into next year anyway is there a risk now that that could finally cause a housing market to crack um, what residential investment, I think Canada's what best part 10% or so of GDP, something like that. So it's certainly I know, a lot harder than we have on uh, across the border. So is there a real downside risk stemming from that if we were to see the Bank of Canada you know, tighten aggressively? I think uh, there are always people who will really feel the pain uh, of higher mortgage rates. But I can see people already switching to uh, locking in the rates instead of uh, um, staying with variables. And Again, uh, the, the problem with the housing market here in Canada is in big cities, Toronto, Vancouver, even here in Victoria, we don't have enough um, uh, homes um, to, to have. And then especially uh, affordable housing, there's a shortage. Mm-hmm. That's why we have homelessness, um, some joblessness. So um, to be really to, you know, coming moving back from Tokyo, it's really strange to see uh, housing prices keep rising, 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 and then um, 
uh, unless this bubble bursts, um, it, it's hard to call it a bubble, but it is a bubble. But um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think uh, the whole, um, the, the bigger picture of the market itself is not going to plunge. It, it may slow down, maybe already slowing down, but not in the sense of um, seeing a, a crisis plunge. Okay, fair enough. Anything else on Canada? Um, I think um, um, it's still uncertain, but as you can remember from last year, we had uh, a very hot, humid summer, mm -hmm. and that caused a lot of problems. So this year, uh, forecast is also the impact of La Nina uh, phenomenon. So we are watching out for any forest fires uh, of, or, or lack of water here. All right. Well, OK, that's a fairly bullish picture of you, given the Canadian economy. Um, but I guess if as a central bank still seemingly determined to support domestic economic activity, it's going to be the Bank of Japan, um, for which yield curve control clearly remains the key. So sticking with you, Max, and moving into the Asian part of the world, um, if this yield curve control is so important to the Bank of Japan at a time when global interest rates are going up, does that say something about how concerned they are about the state of the Japanese real economy? I think uh, not just the Bank of uh, Japan people, but everybody in Japan is so used to seeing contractions and growth uh, uh, coming in and out uh, alternately. If you take a look at the uh, uh, Japan's GDP performances in the past year or during the pandemic, especially uh, uh, from for the first quarter of 2021, it was actually uh, down sharply when uh, into negative uh, when uh, and there's a spike in the COVID cases and up again and rebounds rebounded sharply because. Uh, restrictions were lifted and then then again different variant hits and then um, economic activity plunges. So uh, we've already seen a very um, sharp uh, fl fluctuating movement uh, for the past year and a bit. So um, uh, the, qu the question about uh, recession in Japan, I, I think they're so used to the term uh, recession, but um, if it has to be a technical recession, uh, negative growth for two quarters in a row, then uh, I don't see it's coming at this point because they are tr still trying to recover. And if you take a look at the uh, output gap, uh, this is an estimate by the Bank of Japan just released. Uh, the latest is for the January March quarter, and it's minus 1.25 percentage points, which means right. there's a lot to go before. Yeah. Um, going back to the growth patterns. And the last time we saw the gap uh, uh, in positive was back in the first quarter of 2020, which is just before the pandemic had a um, uh, major impact on the economy. And that was still only uh, uh, plus 0.46 and compared to the peak of um, 2.17 points, that was uh, fourth quarter of 2018, uh, the economy is still didn't really recover uh, much and then going into the pandemic um, uh, it's been still um, um, slow especially the job growth uh, just picking up now uh, compared to the US and Canada um, job markets really slow so from what I've seen there appears to be sort of oh, I don't know sort of a, sorry, a, a growing split anyway however you want to put it uh, between those who believe that keeping rates down to support the real economy is a good thing and those who are getting seriously concerned that yeah, if, if, if they can indeed keep the yield curve where it is at the moment, um, it's going to lead the yen to, you know, well, dollar yen perhaps to rise above 140 or, or even or even there. Um, <laughs> Where, where does it sort of shift at some point? I mean, there's been a lot of talk, I think, in the markets about the Bank of Japan might shorten their, you know, their target for the for JGB yields from 10 years to five years, or they might even extend the tolerance span for the 10 year to, you know, to, to, to more than 0.2 or well, 25 basis points. Um, I mean, do you think there's any credibility or possibility in that? I mean, do you think 
as successful as it's been, relatively speaking, so far in keeping the yield curve under control. If we continue to see the Fed uh, tightening aggressively, we'll almost certainly see the ECB tighten this week. We've got the lights of the RBA, the RBNZ, all getting very aggressive on their interest rate hikes now. Do you think it's, it's, it's plausible that the BOJ can continue to do its own thing? Uh, judging from um, Kuroda's um, um, philosophy and the uh, situation he's in, I don't think uh, the Bank of Japan board is going to make a huge change. I thought first earlier uh, they might quietly expand the um, uh, the band for uh, mm -hmm. the 10-year yield curve to maybe um, plus 0.35 to minus 0.35 from 2.25. Right. But uh, that wouldn't really change the direction of the uh, sharp depreciation at the end. And also, um, that would mean that they they, they would sort of uh, declare, the, 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 like, ex accept the, uh, the defeat in the market. So instead, they actually um, uh, introduced the, um, every business day um, um, operation to to buy uh, JGBs to keep the uh, the rates down so um, uh, that's really show that uh, determination to uh, keep the uh, the targets on the long end and um, uh, short end and the the, the, um, the you mentioned the shift in the target from 10 to five five years mm -hmm. um, if, if they did that then they would have to defend uh, uh, 10 year in somehow, so I don't think it really makes sense. And the, the reason they're st still stuck with it is um, um, back in uh, December 2012, Shinzo Abe uh, won the uh, lower house elections. He brought the um, uh, uh, his party, Liberal Democratic Party, back to power. Um, during the campaign, he said, uh, uh, we're going to regain Japan and um, defeat the uh, uh, deflation and uh, correct the uh, uh, yen strength. It was too strong back then. So um, that, while doing that, he basically uh, forced the Bank of Japan to adopt a very explicit 2% inflation target. And also the government promised to be flexible in fiscal policy and push for deregulation. Um, Growth strategies, deregulation, nothing really happened uh, uh, in a meaning, meaningful way. So the Bank of Japan is alone, left alone, um, pursuing the, uh, the, the target agreement uh, reached in January 2013. And so it's been almost 10 years. Um, they were stuck with this uh, um, aggressive, large scale uh, monetary easing. but. From the very beginning, people were saying, look, we don't want lower interest rates. We're not going to borrow money. What we need is a new supply, new demand, a new products, mm -hmm. new services that match the uh, change in uh, uh, demog uh, demog uh, to, to match the, uh, the, the demand from uh, changing demography, demographic changes. So um, that hasn't really happened yet. So. Um, Keeping the interest rates really low uh, from the very beginning didn't really seem to be working. So, um, but then again, you know, they're stuck with this agreement. So, unless somebody uh, in the government all of a sudden proposes uh, to say, "Okay, we've done enough. You know, we're not going to hit two percent in uh, CPI, so in a stable manner. So, why don't we just lower it to one percent to one point five? Yeah. But then that could be really risky. If for some reason the sentiment in the market uh, shifts to uh, yen buying, then um, it could uh, uh, knock off the dollar from uh, 135, 140 down to 100 and maybe yeah. 95. So uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a political game right now. All right, it is. And um, before I finish, um, I might be asking about Japan. In terms of the politics, we have what upper house coming elections up, don't we, on Sunday? Um, are they relevant or are they not really particularly important as far as markets concerned? Um, nobody really expect expects an upset, um, which means uh, 
the LDP and its uh, coalition partner, Komeito, they will probably maintain the uh, majority. Uh, I mean, mind you, uh, uphouse elections uh, l less important uh, compared to uh, lower house uh, elections, but uh, right. um, still, you know, if if the ruling part, uh, ruling coalition uh, loses uh, a lot of seats, then that that's going to be a market mover. But at this point, I don't see any uh, impact from the election results. Okay, excellent. Any else from your side, Max? Uh, I think the biggest uh, piece of news. Um, in Japan this past week was uh, one of the major carriers uh, in Japan. The uh, cell phone and data uh, systems went down and I think for about two days people couldn't talk to each other by uh, cell phone or couldn't use their um, data services unless they had free Wi-Fi or something. So that uh, sort of reminds you that uh, um, you know, contrary to the high tech image, the digitization and infrastructure of um, internet and uh, uh, system, including the banking systems, uh, they're still behind. So maybe that's why uh, Japan's Japanese companies' intention to invest in uh, equipment is still high. That was found in uh, Bank of Japan's latest the Tankan survey. So hopefully that will support part of the GDP and. Uh, they will um, um, get out of the, uh, uh, the slump. OK, well, I'll tell you what, from my experience living just outside London, trying to get a, a cell phone signal here sometimes is a complete joke. Anyway, thanks for that, Max. Right, let, let's get across to China then. Um, well, I guess uh, Brian on previous podcasts has been talking about you know, some of the problems of China and the fact that what happens in China at the moment is so important to uh, what happens to the rest of the, the global economy. So, Brian, previously you've been talking about uh, you know, a cautiously negative picture, but still uncertain because we've been waiting for these lockdowns to end and what that might actually mean for recovery in demand. So where do we stand in terms of a Chinese economy now? And indeed, I suppose real answer, although I don't suppose anyone's talking about outright recession, you know, is there any chance? of a, you know, a, a, a faster than expected slowdown out there? Well, uh, you know, we've had PMI survey uh, data for, for June over the last few days, and, and they've shown a, a, a pretty strong uh, recovery in both the manufacturing and the services sectors in China, um, you know, pretty much entirely driven by the fact that uh, authorities there have um, relaxed a lot of the restrictions, you know, particularly in, in places like Shanghai and Beijing, so, so, so got, quick, can I ask you, have they, have they gone now or are they, are, they, are they still active, these restrictions? Uh, I mean, there's still there's still a lot of restrictions uh, compared with um, you know, other countries in the region. Uh, so, you know, they, they haven't completely abandoned, um, you know, their uh, zero COVID policy. But the fact is that they've, they've been able to get on top of some of the outbreaks um, that, that we've seen over the last uh, few months. And, and so that's allowed them to um, you know, release some of the shackles. And you know, so we, we've seen that uh, impacted in the in the PMI survey uh, numbers. So, yeah, you know, I think going forward, that you know, if they can keep uh, control of the public health uh, situation, that will allow them to to keep on moving down this path, and and we, we could see a bit more of a bounce back in uh, the, the the economic data over the next couple of months. So, in, in a way, sort of China's already had um, a, a you know a slowdown. Uh, at the start of the year um, that was pretty much entirely driven by the public health measures that were put in place. Um, and so they might then have sort of already had their um, bit of pain and hopefully uh, things might improve going forward. Uh, so it's it's kind of a di uh, in a different situation than uh, a lot of the other uh, major economies around the world. Yeah, I'm saying it's interesting. I've just mentioned in the intro where some of these commodity markets have come off, and that must have been at least partly due to reduced demand coming out of China. So, um, yeah. if that is the case, you kind of wonder if China does start picking up again, then perhaps some of these markets will start will start in turn, you know, responding to it. Um, okay, um, move close to your neck of the woods, um, Australia. Another interest rate hike out of the uh, the RBA earlier on today and uh, still very much talking about higher interest rates. So in the context of what we've been talking about sort of generally, though, are there any concerns about what's happening to the real economy in Australia or is it still all about inflation? Oh, no, there's definitely it's, it's started to pick up. I mean, I think if you did a, a Internet search for Australia and recession over the last uh, you know 
few weeks that, that there would you'd have more hits than what you did, um, you know, a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're sort of in this sort of classic tightening cycle, aren't we? We've had, um, you know, central banks all around the world, including Australia, really uh, having their foot hard on the accelerator for the last couple of years. And then um, now we're seeing them, you know, slam on the brakes pretty hard. So the hope, obviously, is that that leads to a controlled slowdown in the Australian economy. But um, obviously the danger is that, you know, you could run into the ditch and, and, and things uh, sort of get stalled for, for a while. So, you know, obviously we're not seeing the Reserve Bank of Australia or the Australian government forecast a recession. Um, they're, uh, you know, maintaining the line that, you know, things will slow down in a controlled and, um, you know, a gradual manner. But, uh, you know, clearly there, there are risks that uh, they'll have to really go hard on, on policy rates to get inflation down. And that's, that's going to leave, you know, various sectors of the economy vulnerable. And, uh, you know, we, we might see things slow down pretty sharply. Okay, um, you've had um, a number of floods, certainly in the Sydney Sydney region, not for the first time. It's got to be said this year. Um, is that going to have implications for global growth, or is it too local? Sorry, global growth, Australian growth, I should say. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, or is it too localized? Uh, it, it's going to have a, an impact, uh, you know, particularly, um, you know, in, in in the near term. And and as you said, this isn't the first that we've had this year. So, you know, if you if you look at all the uh, the, the, the impacts uh, cumulatively is definitely uh, ha having a, a noticeable impact on on a lot of key uh, parts of the of the of the local economy, and and that will flow through to the to the headline GDP number. But it's it's probably right now the the bigger concern is what impact it might have on on uh, inflation in the near term. Um, obviously, a lot of uh, you know we're seeing food uh, prices go up pretty sharply in in the country, and. Uh, and uh, this is just going to exacerbate that. So it's probably not a, a, you know, a, a number one sort of uh, issue that's going to be driving the, the data, but it's going to be there in the background. Uh, it's just a sort of another uh, item on the list of things to worry about uh, right. going forward. Probably the you know, the bigger concern, though, at the moment is just how the housing market holds up uh, you know, as the RBA tightens policy aggressively. Uh, you know, Just very low interest rates over the last few years has obviously encouraged a lot of people to to really go hard in, in on, on housing and you know they're vulnerable now once you know sort of variable rates start to increase um to uh you know it's going to impact mortgage mortgage payments and uh also then impact non-discretionary uh spending on, on on many parts of the economy and so that's probably the the main thing to look out for going forward OK, in terms of polish, I guess I've got to ask you an incomplete contrast to um, what Max was saying about with regards to Japan. Um, yield curve control in Australia. I mean, it appears to be sort of, you know, being given the big elbow now. I mean, is that it or do you think it might come back again? No, I think it was, it was very much just a, um, a last resort sort of tool that was used uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and I, I don't think the, the RBA was ever comfortable uh, with this approach. And, um, you know, they've now sort of said, you know, we, we probably didn't do it as well as we, we should have uh, during the pandemic. And um, so they're not ruling out using it again in, in, the, part, in, in the future if, if circumstances require. But um, again, I think they, they, they'll be reluctant to do it and uh, they'll try and review the experience of the last few, few years and see if they can... Um, you know, uh, implement it more effic efficiently if, if they do have to do it again. But it's, I, I don't think it's ever going to be, um, you know, a, a very highly uh, used tool in their, in their toolbox. Um, they, they definitely prefer to uh, just go the traditional route of, of, of uh, adjusting policy rates. OK, fair enough. Um, let's whiz across to New Zealand then. I guess of uh, most of the central banks, um, the Kiwis have been you know, seen as being the, the, amongst those most likely to raise interest rates. Um, is that still the case or are there any concerns about what's happening to the, uh, the domestic real economy there? Uh, I, th I think they've still uh, got, um, you know, they're still firmly in, in tightening mode as well. You know, they were probably one of the first ones to start, I think, uh, going back to October. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, they're often, you know, the, the central bank there is often pretty aggressive um, in, in its uh, attempts to try and keep inflation under control. And so we're seeing that now. And I think, you know, they've still got uh, a way to go now. You, I mean, you could say that New Zealand's already halfway to recession because they had a negative quarter uh, in, in the first quarter of the year. But, you know, that was only a very small uh, forward growth. And it was probably more driven by 
well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was more driven by the, the the public health restrictions that were put in place in response to the to the Omicron uh, variant, rather than sort of a you know a broader um, weakness in the economy. So, you you might see uh, a bit of a bounce back in the current you know quarter just finished, the second quarter of the year. But of course, you know that that uh, rebound is also going to be impacted by the fact that you know they've started tightening policy. Uh, towards the end of last year and, and have sort of gone harder and faster than a lot of other central banks around the world. So I think that they are vulnerable to, uh, um, you know, the monetary policy tightening having an impact on on the uh, economic activity over the second half of the year. Uh, but, um, you know, that's that's kind of where we are in, in, in the cycle of, you know, just trying to get inflation back under control and, and you know, hoping that it doesn't have too much damage to the to the real economy. Yeah, right. OK. And, and, re- and regards, and that's sort of a general question in terms of my, the last thing I, I was going to ask you. And we've had sort of, you know, ages now whereby a lot of the Asian central banks anyway have been you know, building up their foreign exchange reserves. But it seems now that they, well, we've had a number of fairly sharp reforms coming out of what, you know, Thailand, Indonesia, South Korea, India, remember rightly as well, over the course of the last year or so in response to dollar strength. So, I mean, are the signs that you know, part and part of trying to keep domestic inflation under control is the fact that they're not prepared, like Japan, for example, to allow the local currencies to de- depreciate significantly against the dollar. Yeah, I mean they're they're concerned. Um, you know, I, I think generally speaking, they they want things to be, you know, reasonably stable. You know, they they probably do have a bias towards uh, um, you know a weaker currency, particularly when when things are slowing down to try and, and, and mm-hmm. boost their their exports. But you know, they they want it to be done in a you know a pretty uh, you know controlled and um, you know, gradual manner. You know, I think that's generally the the the, the preference of of policymakers, uh, and so that's that's no exception here uh, for for those countries. Uh, you know, because of course, you know, their probably main vulnerability at the moment is the fact that you know, in in many parts of of Asia, the economy is is heavily dependent on external demand. So, right. Uh, you know, whereas some other countries might be worried about uh, the housing market in particular. I think uh, officials uh, right across most of these Asian economies are worried that okay, if we see the U.S. slow down and 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 Europe slow down very aggressively, then that's going to really uh, uh, have an impact on our exports, and that's going to uh, you know be a major factor that determines whether or not we avoid recession. So um, at the moment, they're they're kind of just crossing their fingers, I think, and hoping that these major economies can um, you know manage a, a controlled slowdown. OK, excellent. Thanks for that, Brian. Anything else from uh, your, side, your side you'd like to put in? No, I think it's just, um, you know, as I said at the start, China is probably the outlier in that they um, have already had a, a, a bit of economic pain driven by their zero COVID policy at the start of the year. But, you know, right for, for most of the region, you know, we're, we're just in this, uh, you know, sort of classic tightening cycle. And um, it, it's it's hard to predict just uh, how, how much of an impact it's going to have on, on the real economy. Yeah, and it's true for a lot of the central bank forecasts as well. They've got about as much idea as anybody else. OK, great. Thanks for that, Brian. Um, right, we'll round off this podcast with just a quick summary of what's going on in Europe then. And I guess when we're looking around sort of the major regions, then Europe, sadly, if you're part of it, uh, stands out as being one of the most uh, likely to fall into some kind of recession over the course of the coming quarters. Um, really, for Europe, of course, as Russia continues to reduce gas supplies, uh, so recession risks really just continued to mount. Um, just yesterday, the central Centre for Economics and Business Research think tank here in London put the probability of recession in Europe at 40 percent. But with the uh, continent in general so dependent on Russian energy, it also pointed out that a complete shut off would make a recession near certainty. And to all intents and purposes, that really seems uh, you know, most likely at the moment. And the Bundesbank already suggested that uh, were we to see uh, the gas uh, Russian gas taps turned off completely. It could subtract at least five percentage points off uh, German GDP. Some estimates say it could be even more than that. Bear in mind, of course, as we talked before, that Eurozone receives uh, what around a quarter of its energy from natural gas, with Russia accounting for about what one third of the bloc's imports and and 55 percent for Germany before the war began. So reduced supply in Europe is already hitting industry quite hard. Uh, gas prices hit yet 
another record high today. And all in all, it's undermining consumer and business confidence in, ger in general. And indeed, just looking at you know, some of the pure economic numbers, quite a novelty uh, came out yesterday with the Mer Ger May German trader number. I've been so used to huge surpluses in Germany for a long time now. And indeed, a lot of the other European countries leaning on the German administration to uh, loosen its fiscal policy in order to try and reduce it. Well, actually fell into that actually fell into a deficit for the first time in three decades. So it's uh, still very much a tricky time as far as Europe's concerned. Uh, Russia now has reduced its gas supply through the key Nord Stream 1 pipeline that runs through the Baltic Sea by about 60%. Uh, so Berlin last Thursday triggered the second stage of its three-stage national gas emergency plan. Austria, Denmark, the Netherlands and Sweden have already also announced the first stage of their emergency procedures as well to try and preserve gas supplies. Now none of that actually means rationing so far but nonetheless the big picture is that you know the outlook in terms of energy supplies going into Europe and hence the outlook for the European economy in general is getting that much worse as each day it seems to go by so in terms of the actual hard data at the moment well there's good news well so there's good news there's good news in the sense that uh, the latest purchasing managers index the composite measure was still above 50 at 52 uh, for June but that was its lowest number in 16 months and what we are seeing is that business optimism has continued to deteriorate. That's at about a 20 month low now. I'm um, for choice. I'd reckon that second quarter GDP for the Eurozone will still be positive, but there's certainly growing downside risk. Inflation now, largely courtesy of what's happening to energy prices, is up at some 8.6%. So that's more than six and a half percentage points above the ECB's target target, excuse me, and that of course is going to add to recession risks as uh, consumer budgets continue to be tightened. Um, in terms of what the ECB is going to do, well, it's very much still a split board, I think, as far as the ECB goes. Um, it does seem now, and if you believe what the ECB said um, at their last meeting, uh, July will see a 25 basis point increase in interest rates. And with every chance, that will be followed by a 50 basis point hike. But nonetheless, given the vulnerability of the Eurozone or European economy, I should say, to what's happening in terms of energy prices coming out of Russia, it may be the case that markets already are getting too aggressive in terms of what they're expecting uh, for uh, interest rates rate tightening out to ECB over coming months. But nonetheless, bottom line is that if you're looking for um, you know, one of the regions more likely or more exposed to the threat of uh, some kind of recession, Europe stands out at the moment. Within that, I'd also have to mention, I suppose, the pick of the bunch, sadly, if you live in the UK, and that's going to be the UK. Um, and quite interestingly, too, compared to a lot of the other central banks, which are really making uh, decidedly aggressive noises about the need to contain inflation, I mean, including the ECB. Now, obviously, the likes of the, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada. Uh, the Bank of England, although it's still kind of intimating that interest rates are going to have to go up, we've had the, the central bank governing ad come out over the last couple of days or so, intimating that uh, it may be the case that it won't have to uh, act forcefully to get inflation under control. The bottom line, it seems, is that due to what is a, well, a severe tightening on the household budgets going through at the moment due to higher prices, rising interest rates, and indeed tax increases as well from the last budget. It means that the UK perhaps is perceived as being amongst the major economies the most likely to fall into some kind of recession over the course of the next couple of quarters or so. Um, consumer confidence, according to some surveys, is at a record low. Business confidence is also de declining rapidly. Confederation of British Industry here, one of the major industrial bodies, also warning that a recession is just around the corner. And although it's fair to say that the UK is not so dependent upon Russian energy supplies as uh, its Europe own counterparts, nonetheless, uh, we had news today that due to some strikes happening in Norway, which is by far and away the UK most important provider of natural gas is yeah, the possibility that the gas tap might actually be turned off to the UK for this weekend. So bottom line is it's still a pretty difficult picture. Just before we wrap things up, I should also mention Switzerland. By and large, the Swiss economy has been outperforming certainly market expectations, but also a lot of the Eurozone group of countries as well. And that could turn out to be particularly important in terms of the currency. 
uh, recession risks at this stage anyway in Switzerland look likely to be relatively limited. Um, some of the concerns regarding uh, Russian energy supplies and the like, not as key there as in the likes of Germany or Italy. Um, and of course, following the Swiss National Bank's surprise decision to hike interest rates at their last policy meeting in June, that's made the Swiss franc all the more attractive. Indeed, the, uh, the key euro Swiss franc cross actually took out the parity level last week, and it's going to be interesting to see just how much further that cross can move over the course of coming weeks, if not months. Indeed, will the Swiss National Bank intervene or essentially have they really just decided to allow the currency to do its own thing? That's certainly going to be one to keep an eye on. OK, then, so that is it for this time. Uh, the shift in market sentiment over the last week or so has been dramatic. It may be that it's been overdone, but with recession looking at least likely in some parts of the world and at least possible pretty much everywhere else, the economic landscape and with it, the policy outlook is clearly changing. All of which means that keeping on top of the major economic statistics and other key market moving events in Econoday's global economic calendar is more important than ever. So do check it out. In the meantime, on behalf of Terry, Max Braun and myself, thanks as always for listening. We hope to see you again next time. Bye for now.